New Jersey's Atlantic shoreline. From the industrial waters of New York Harbor, to beaches lining the New Jersey coast, to the historic hub of Atlantic City and beyond. Maintaining New Jersey's maritime highways. Naturally, the harbor was about 19 feet shallow. The channel that is in construction today is being deepened from 35 to 40 feet. Revealing the beauty of the Garden State. We're surrounded here with over a 1,000 acres of woodland. To come out here, you have a totally different feel for New Jersey. And America's most famous boardwalk. It is the first boardwalk in the United States. Now, 50,000 kilometers of eastern coastline are revealed from above. An aerial journey over America's rugged Atlantic frontier. This is America over the edge. High above New York Harbor, the Statue of Liberty stands as one of the United States' most iconic symbols. The statue was a gift from the people of France, honoring the two nations' common quest for freedom and democracy. And while most people associate Lady Liberty with New York City, the geography is not so simple. From the air, it is clear the statue lies just off the New Jersey coast. In fact, Liberty Island is an exclave of Manhattan, New York territory surrounded by the waters of New Jersey. The statue took more than 20 years to complete. A project brought to life by a young sculptor named Auguste Bartoldi. The statue was constructed in pieces in France and shipped across the sea. The torch was unveiled at Philadelphia's Centennial Exposition in 1876. Then it was displayed at Madison Square Garden for six years after that. While construction on the rest of the statue continued, American supporters built a pedestal for this massive monument. It was an incredible effort, the largest concrete construction project of its time. With a base four meters deep, and walls six meters thick. Finally, a 30 meter long iron framework was designed to protect the monument from high winds. The Statue of Liberty was unveiled October 28th, 1886. Less than a kilometer north, Another symbol of early America can be found just off the Jersey City, New Jersey coast. Ellis Island became the United States' first federal immigration station when it opened its doors in 1892. And like the Statue of Liberty, it was a massive undertaking. Landfill from New York City subway tunnels was used to double the size of the island. Then in 1897, the original station burned to the ground, replaced by this French Renaissance revival style structure. By the early 20th century, Ellis Island's immigration station was fully operational. From the air, it's hard to imagine as many as 5,000 new arrivals each day. 
In 1907 alone, more than a million immigrants arrived here. By the time Ellis Island closed its doors in 1954, it had been the entry point for more than 12 million new Americans. Today, Ellis Island operates as a museum and has welcomed more than 40 million visitors since 1990, keen to experience this unique history. The New York, New Jersey Harbor area is a true crossroads, from cultural symbols of the past to the region's modern transportation infrastructure. Just to the west, Newark Liberty Airport is located in the second busiest airspace in the world. And from above, we get a sense of the logistics required to keep this international hub running smoothly. Newark Airport handles nearly 400,000 planes and more than 35 million passengers each year. It also moves 600,000 tons of cargo, providing nearly $23 billion in economic activity for the region. And just east of Newark Liberty Airport, the marine portion of New Jersey's transportation network extends for kilometers all along Newark Bay. From the Port Jersey Marine Terminal, to the Port Newark Elizabeth Marine Terminal. These shipping operations are all part of the Port of New York and New Jersey, the third largest port in the United States. The history of shipping here dates back to the early 20th century, when the city of Newark began excavating shipping channels in the swamps and wetlands that lined the coast. The new port of Newark quickly grew, with 25,000 troops stationed nearby during World War I. Over time, more channels and shipping lanes were added. In 1956, the first container ship set sail for Houston with 58 containers on board. Decades later, dozens of cranes lined the Port Newark Elizabeth Marine Terminal. And from the sky, thousands of shipping containers can be seen. In total, the port handles more than 3 million cargo containers each year, representing 30% of the market share for all shipping on the East Coast. The port is also one of the largest in the nation for automobiles, with 640,000 vehicles coming and going each year. In total, the dollar value for all cargo moved to the port of New York and New Jersey is more than $200 billion. But maintaining this maritime highway network can be a challenge. Throughout New York Harbor and Newark Bay, dredging vessels can be seen. Their job is to make sure shipping lanes are deep enough for the ships that will use them. And in the Arthur Kill, a channel dividing Staten Island from the New Jersey coast, 
the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is completing an 18-year-long project. They are deepening this narrow waterway from 35 to 40 feet. The purpose of the New York and New Jersey Harbor Deepening Program is to facilitate the transport of bigger container ships and oil tanker ships into and out of the port of New York and New Jersey. New York, New Jersey is the largest port for container ships on the eastern seaboard and the largest refined petroleum port in the United States. But there's a problem. Ships are getting bigger. Naturally, this harbor was about 19 feet shallow. Over the last century, there's been a number of deepening projects that have taken the port down to what it is now today, and the main shipping channel is 50 feet. The channel that is in construction today is being deepened from 35 to 40 feet. The current ships now are upwards of 1,200 feet long. That's over a city block. And their draft, both into the water as well as out of it, has gotten huge with the expansion of the Panama Canal, which is currently underway. For that reason, we're not only deepening the channels within the harbor, but our sponsor, the Port Authority of Newark and New Jersey, is also raising some of the bridges coming into the harbors to allow for air draft for the ships to fit under the bridge. Below water, it's a demanding task, removing 40 million tons of material. They use a variety of dredges, including excavator dredges, clamshell dredges, and hopper dredges. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. All day long, the employee transport barge is loaded up and heads offshore. This operation runs on shifts, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're now going westward in the Arthur Kill Channel in the southern end of Newark Bay. We're headed west now. In the distance, you can see New Jersey, and off to the left, you can see New York Container Terminal, which is located on Staten Island. The dredge we're heading to is the Great Lakes Dredge 54, one of the largest clamshell dredges in Great Lakes fleet. The Great Lakes Dredge 54 is located just past the Gothels Bridge, a clamshell dredge scooping up material from far below. In total, we've removed about 40 million cubic yards of material in deepening the harbor. That involves primarily about 10 million cubic yards of silt material at the surface, about 10 million yards of sandy material from the lower bay Ambrose Channel, and then the remaining 20 million cubic yards is primarily a combination of glacial till, clay, and bedrock. In the operator's cabin, Doug Smith is picking up silt, and below that, red and brown shale. We're dredging the channel here. I'm the dredge operator. So I'm coming down next to the marks on my screen here. I'm going to get a bucket next to the last one and try to get some rock. The bucket's a 12-yard bucket. So level bucket is 12 yards. I'm closing the bucket now slow. Hopefully grab some rock. Smith is working a new stretch of water where the team has been tasked with removing 60,000 cubic meters of material, one bucket load at a time. When it's silt, it's no problem. But rock can be a challenge. Sometimes it's too hard to get into. It's not blasted. So far, we're getting some. If we dig all the way around, I don't know if you can see here, try to keep the bucket contour a certain way. Sometimes we got to move it. Sometimes the antenna moves us, so it don't show up exactly right. But I'll stay this contour, another bucket or two, and then I'll boom down. 
And when the buckets turn up empty, it's time to lower the boom and go deep. So now I'm booming down. We get some more buckets just in front of these. How deep I have to dig or can dig. The surveyors or engineers, company engineers will tell us what our digging depth should be, what we stop, where we stop digging at, what station. We take it from there. Try to give them what they ask for if we can. You know, like with rock, it's a little harder. For the team aboard the Great Lakes 54 dredge, their project will soon come to an end. But along the Arthur Kill and the waters of Newark Bay, there will always be shipping lanes to maintain on one of the busiest waterways in the world. I don't know how to explain it. I've been dredging 28 years, so I, I don't know how to explain it. I've just been doing all this stuff for a long time. I've worked all over the East Coast in Puerto Rico. It's the job, you know. Some days are better than others. Mud comes up real easy and you could load her quick. You dig a rock, it's a little harder. It's quite an honor to be involved with this project because this $1.6 billion project spanning 16 years has involved literally within the core dozens upon dozens of people and with the broader stakeholders are sponsored New York State, New York City, uh, New Jersey, DEP, uh, so many different stakeholders as well as environmental groups, uh, port advocate uh, groups, as well as the public. Uh, it's been an honor to be able to be involved with this project and to see it to its conclusion. The Port of New York and New Jersey is located in the heart of the largest urban population in America. But even here, pristine nature can be seen not far from the coast. Inland, the New Jersey interior reveals a vast palette of landscapes. Just beyond the city of Newark and nearly surrounded by suburbs, the South Mountain Reservation is a nature preserve covering more than 2,000 acres. It dates back to the late 1800s when a series of private properties were amalgamated to form the first protected area of its kind in the region. From above, we see hardwoods and hemlocks soar above streams, creeks, and other waterways, including the Orange Reservoir, once part of the water supply system here. Amazingly, more than a century after it was established, the South Mountain Reservation has maintained its wild and natural state. And from the sky, we see just how close this natural wonder is to civilization, with the New York, New Jersey skyline in plain sight. Ten kilometers west, the forests thin and the landscape begins to change. Similar to the wetlands lining Newark Bay where the first shipping channels were built, much of the New Jersey interior is covered in swampland. And this is the Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge, established in 1960 and named a national natural landmark six years later. From above, the composition of the ground can truly be felt. More than 30 square kilometers of forested wetlands. The history of swampland here dates back to the Ice Age, when this was the base of a glacial lake formed by the melting waters of the retreating Wisconsin Glacier. The lake drained, but the swamp remained. Today, Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge is just one of dozens of swamps that dot New Jersey. It is home to a variety of wildlife, including birds, reptiles, and amphibians, as well as 29 species of fish and 600 species of plants.
40 kilometers northeast and further inland, the hills rise once again. Not far from the New York state line, vast tracts of forest extend for kilometers. This marks the boundary of the Skylands region, an area marked by rolling hills and lakes, lined by two national parks and multiple state parks. And far below, Skyline Drive leads to the remote wilderness of Ramapo Mountain State Forest. This forest covers 17 square kilometers of pristine nature, a popular spot for hiking, hunting, and fishing. And just north of Ramapo Mountain State Forest, one of New Jersey's natural wonders is revealed. The New Jersey Botanical Gardens is the garden of the Garden State. Living in New Jersey, uh, most people think of the Turnpike and the, you know, the, the very urban areas that you see. New Jersey does have a lot of areas like this. Um, we're up in the mountains. Um, it is not that far from, from the urban setting. And to come out here, you have a totally different feel for New Jersey. The New Jersey Botanical Gardens, once known as Skyland Farm, is an incredible estate with 11 gardens founded by a New York City lawyer more than a century ago. All right, Skyland dates back to 1891 uh, with a man named Francis Lynn Stetson. He was a corporate lawyer uh, from New York City. He set out to purchase uh, many of these farmsteads up in the Ramapo Mountain Hills here and um, acquired approximately 1,000 acres. At the time, it was known as a gentleman's working farm with lush forests and a golf course. Here, Francis Stetson would entertain New York City's most distinguished figures. They, they, they traveled uh, by rail out to, out to this estate out here um, from the city, from New York City. You know, within a few hours, they could be out of the city um, and out here in, in the hills of Ramapos. Later, the estate was sold to Clarence Lewis an investment banker who was more interested in plants and gardens than entertaining. He developed the gardens we see today and replaced the Stetson House with his Tudor-style mansion. Clarence Lewis met Mr. Stetson, actually. Uh, he was very much a plant collector, and he'd, he'd love to have a place like this that he could set out to, to collect plants. Uh, so he partnered with his mother, who was widowed at the time, to purchase the Stetson Estate uh, in 1922. He uh, kept impeccable records of, of all the plantings and where they were and when he got them and where he got them from. In 1966, the state of New Jersey purchased the estate, updated it, and changed the name to the New Jersey Botanical Gardens. But years later, it is the influence of Clarence Lewis that can still be felt in this maze of gardens. As you walk through the gardens, there are many of these intersecting views or vistas, which uh, kind of make you want to go toward that way to see what's at the end. And off to one side, this protected collection of flowers marks the first stop in the tour. The first area I'd like to show you is this fenced in area over here, which is our hosta and rhododendron garden. And the reason why it's fenced in is to uh, keep the deer out, which uh, this, those plantings are, are like a salad to them. 
Now that we're inside, you can see that we have a quite nice selection of, um, of hostas. We have over 400 different varieties of hostas in here, as well as the other plantings, all these uh, evergreens, these broadleaf evergreens are different varieties of, of rhododendrons. This area is shaded by uh, these many of these large um, red and white oaks, which give you a nice canopy of shade uh, for these shade-loving plants. Um, and as you look down through the whole area here, it's a very informal, kind of a woodland collection in here. Uh, there's also ferns um, and a lot of other shade-loving plants in here as well. The next stop is not far from the manor house, where a carefully designed landscape is a reminder of the historic significance of the estate. These are the terraced gardens. Um, they, are, they are stepped down. Um, you can see that we have, there's actually four terraces here. We're standing on the upper terrace, which, and then we drop down a set of stairs, and it's, you have these balustrades, uh, and then there's a wall, and then we have this long pool here and then it drops again to another garden, which is we call the summer garden. And then there's actually another set of steps which drops down and you see in the distance there, there's, um, there's a, a, a bench area with a tree um, that kind of ends the formal terraces here. And a row of trees leading to the mansion were planted by Clarence Lewis himself. Okay, looking back toward the house, this is facing north. Um, you can see um, this is Magnolia Walk here, which is lined with uh, Sweet Bay Magnolias, which bloom uh, in June and they're fragrant. And that was one of the reasons why he planted these trees. He wanted a lot of fragrance uh, closer to the house. This is the rear portion of Skylands, uh, which is south facing. Um, this is, uh, you can notice that it's uh, more of the Tudor style with the half timbers and the stucco. This afforded a beautiful view from the house uh, looking south um, and towards the mountains. For Rich Flynn, the New Jersey Botanical Gardens is an amazing place. One that can be easily overlooked in the secluded Skylands region. This is a great place to be. Um, you, you don't find a lot of gardens, especially estate gardens, still existing um, the way they would have been. We're surrounded here at Skylands with over a thousand acres of woodland. Um, and it's just a place uh, where you come and uh, a little respite uh, from the hustle and bustle. Back to the coast and 20 kilometers southeast of Newark Bay, a point of land appears on the horizon. It is Sandy Hook, a barrier spit nearly 10 kilometers long, protecting New York City's lower bay from the rough waters of the Atlantic. For centuries, this marked the safest route to approach New York, hugging the deep waters lining Sandy Hook, then continuing to the city. Sandy Hook was purchased by the federal government in 1814 and spared from development, making it unique along this stretch of Jersey Shore. And far below, Sandy Hook is home to another iconic American symbol. Sandy Hook Light is the oldest lighthouse still in use in the United States. It was designed and constructed in 1764, an octagonal shaped tower more than 30 meters high. When it was built, the light stood just 150 meters from the tip of Sandy Hook. But over time, silt and sediment deposits have expanded this barrier spit to the north 
Today, Sandy Hook Light is located 2.4 kilometers inland. While the geography of Sandy Hook has protected the region from rough waters, and the light has guided mariners along the coast, another landmark stands as a reminder of Sandy Hook's military past. Sandy Hook was occupied by the British during the American Revolution. After the war, a series of military fortifications were developed through the War of 1812 and the Civil War. Then, in 1895, the fortifications became known as Fort Hancock, and for nearly a century, it offered military protection to this stretch of the Atlantic until 1974, when Fort Hancock was decommissioned. Forty kilometers south of Sandy Hook, we begin tracing 200 kilometers of beaches, barrier beaches, and islands lining the Jersey Shore. And from high above, we see the vast expanse of communities that line the beaches here. From Spring Lake to Manasquan, these communities date back to the Gilded Age of the late 19th century when they were coastal resorts for residents of New York and Philadelphia. And just south of Manasquan, the coastal geography changes as we approach the protected waters of Barnegat Bay. Here, residents in the community of Point Pleasant have a unique relationship with the water surrounding. From a bird's eye view, we get an incredible perspective on Beaver Dam Creek, Bayhead Harbor, and the tiny channels that connect to them. In these communities, waterways act like city streets, and a boat is as good as a car. The community of Point Pleasant is even cut in half by the Point Pleasant Canal which marks the northernmost extension of the Intracoastal Waterway, a stretch of sheltered waters offering mariners safe passage all the way to Florida. Back to the coast and heading south, the community of Maniloking marks another change in geography as the sandy beach lining the New Jersey coast splits from the mainland, forming a barrier peninsula. The Barnegat Peninsula extends 32 kilometers. Amazingly, much of the peninsula is less than a kilometer wide and is home to communities like Chadwick Beach and Seaside Heights. They are considered some of the wealthiest and safest communities in all of New Jersey. Many are summer residences for sun seekers all along the eastern seaboard. But with their proximity to the sea, these homes are constantly at risk. From above, it is clear to see these communities are surrounded by water. In 2012, Hurricane Sandy wreaked havoc here, destroying piers and homes, with storm surges carving new temporary inlets between Barnegat Bay and the sea.
70 kilometers south of Sandy Hook, coastal development comes to a halt as we approach Island Beach State Park. It is New Jersey's longest stretch of undeveloped coast. The park is home to dense maritime forests, rolling dunes, and tidal marshes, all shaped by storms and tides over thousands of years. And Island Beach State Park leads to Barnegat Inlet, the gateway to Barnegat Bay. It was described as a dangerous, turbulent waterway by Henry Hudson in 1609. A great lake of water as we could judge it to be. The mouth of the lake hath many shoals, and the sea breaketh on them as it is cast out of the mouth of it. Finally, opposite the inlet on Long Beach Island, Barnegat Light is the second of three historic lights along the Jersey Shore. Barnegat Light, known as Old Barney, dates back to 1834. In that year, the first Barnegat Light was constructed 270 meters back from water. Within a decade, the sea was just 140 meters away. In 1856, work began on a second light, this one four times higher than the first. It would become a crucial navigation aid on a stretch of coast infamous for currents, shifting sandbars, and adamant shoals, challenging even the most experienced sailors. Continuing south above Long Beach Island, we return to civilization. This barrier island is home to communities like Surf City and Beach Haven, and is home to 20,000 year-round residents. But from the sky, an even larger population center can be seen. 40 kilometers to the southwest, the skyline of Atlantic City rises high. It has been a seaside attraction for generations. Adorned with hotels and resorts, its dozen casinos, and as the inspiration for the board game Monopoly. It is also known for its world famous boardwalk. The idea of creating the boardwalk was to keep sand out of the hotel lobbies that lined the boardwalk. Um, it was originally a temporary structure. Over time, it became a permanent structure. They used to roll it up at the end of the season and lay it down each, each May. But what we have now is um, a permanent structure. Our boardwalk has become famous. It is the first boardwalk in the United States and um, many others have replicated the boardwalk, but there is still only one Atlantic City boardwalk. But dig in a little deeper, and Atlantic City has an incredible past. In its early history, a great deal of the people were the Lenni Lenape Indians who came here and took advantage of the bay and also the ocean. And then hunters would come here, and then visitors started coming um, from Pennsylvania, primarily Philadelphia, and also New York. By the mid-19th century, the jewel that was Atlantic City was no longer a secret. Atlantic City was incorporated in May 1854. Um, this real estate here was viewed by developers as prime real estate. 
um, for a vacation destination. Its best known era was early in the 20th century when vacationers came to Atlantic City for another reason. The Prohibition era, that is still considered by many historians as Atlantic City's greatest time. But it was during that time, during Prohibition, where liquor was, was greatly um, used here in Atlantic City. And with the development of transportation infrastructure, more people were able to visit. Slowly, rooming houses built for weekend visitors grew into the massive high-rises we see today. They developed the Camden Atlantic City Railroad. The initial railroad, it would take two and a half hours <laughs> to get from, from Camden to Atlantic City, which now we could drive it in 40 minutes, thanks to the Atlantic City Expressway. The first hotel was the Bellow House that was built in 1854, and it was located on Massachusetts and Atlantic Avenues. In more recent years, Atlantic City has struggled to retain its reputation as one of the top vacation spots on the East Coast. Now the city is taking a new approach to its identity and looking to the future. The prospect for Atlantic City is great. Um, right now we're undergoing a, um, a reinvention of the city. The city is starting to focus on more non-casino attractions. We're hoping to bring families back to Atlantic City. There's really been an emphasis on in creating an art district. We now have a noise arts garage here located in the city that houses many um, of the up-and-coming artists. We also have an Art Atlantic project where um, vacant lots throughout the city and also along the boardwalk um, it's used for art projects until that particular area is developed. Atlantic City is a special place for me. This is my home. I was born and raised here in Atlantic City. Uh, I had a great life growing up here, and uh, I am invested in seeing the city survive. Moving southwest, another barrier island is home to another scenic community lining the Jersey Shore. Ocean City boasts more than 10 kilometers of pristine beachfront and is known as one of the top family destinations on the East Coast. Like Atlantic City, it was originally settled by Native Americans, drawn by the rich fishing grounds surrounding. Later, in 1879, four Methodist ministers established a religious retreat here. They chose the name Ocean City and laid the groundwork for a new community, building streets, homes, and attracting businesses. More than a century later, the religious legacy of Ocean City can still be felt. In stark contrast to nearby Atlantic City, public consumption of alcohol here is still strictly prohibited. Further southwest, the barrier island of Five Mile Beach is home to the Wildwoods, a collection of five communities named for the wildflowers found in the region. North Wildwood is home to roughly 5,000 people and marks the beginning of one of New Jersey's most popular beaches. And the North Wildwood waterfront is home to another Jersey Shore tradition, Surfside Pier is just one of dozens of amusement parks lining this coast. But while the beaches of the Wildwoods seem pristine, they need constant care. B 
beach erosion is a problem throughout New Jersey. In the past 30 years, a billion dollars has been spent moving sand. In North Wildwood, the beach has been eroding for years. Strong storm surges require sand to be piped in from Wildwood, just to the south, where sand is more plentiful. Strong dune systems are key to the long-term survival of this coast. Finally, just southwest of the Wildwoods, Cape May appears on the horizon. And here at the southern tip of New Jersey, the third iconic lighthouse on this sandy stretch of coast can be seen. Cape May Lighthouse is the third light station to be built here. Constructed in 1859, it replaced two previous stations, which if still standing today, would be underwater. The Cape May Lighthouse is more than 50 meters high, with 199 steps to reach the top. The light has been a tourist destination for more than a century. In 1882, it was reported that Superintendent Samuel Stilwell takes pleasure in showing visitors who have the nerve and strength of limb to the top, the interior of the lantern, and explaining the interesting operations of the light. Today, that tradition continues. 80,000 visitors come to experience this iconic light each year at the end of the Jersey Shore. From Newark Bay and the industrial waters lining the port of New York and New Jersey. To Sandy Hook and the beaches of the Jersey Shore. To Atlantic City and the barrier islands that have been drawing vacationers for generations. New Jersey's Atlantic coast is a mix of industry, history, and recreation. And from above, the scope of this shoreline can truly be appreciated. In the unique canals and waterways of Point Pleasant. In the swamps and wetlands just inland. and in the ever-moving sands that mark a constant challenge in preserving and protecting this unique stretch of Atlantic coast. Here on the edge of America. <laughs>